राजयोग ओम नम श्री यतिराजाय विवेकानंद सूर सचेतसुखस्वूपाय स्वामी नेतापहारिणे वी हैव नियरली रीच द एंड ऑफ दिस टॉक टुडे इज आवर थर्टी सिक्स टॉक एंड आई थिंक दिस इज द सेकेंड लास्ट टॉक वी होप टू कवर इट in the next talk so very surprisingly we had uh, raj yog in bengali and that is also in 36 talks and this is in 37 talks quite similar of course bengali talks were sometimes uh, longer talks were classes were longer coming back to where we had left it was uh, fourth chapter sutra number 10 तासाम अनादित्व च आशीषो नित्यत्वात् एसेंशियली दिस चैप्टर इज डिस्कसिंग द डिफरेंस बिटवीन माइंड एंड पुरुष दैट इज सोल एंड इन द प्रोसेस इट आल्सो डिस्कसेस द नेचर ऑफ माइंड वन ग्रेट थिंग अबाउट दीज इंडियन फिलासफर्स ऑफ एंशियन टाइम्स वॉज एंड कंटिन्यूज टू बी they have a very clear purpose what exactly they want they are just not meandering in the thought world if you look at this western philosophy they just moving around they come up with different names like serendipity and things like that they are exploring things in indian system of thought the goal is clear i want mukti i want liberation <laughs> things that are blocking you from attaining that state are taken up one by one and shown how these are inadequate and how these instead of being props instead of being your support they are actually hindrances other things have been discussed now the focus is on mind and right now what we have been discussing is that if you look at certain amounts of desires how can you have desire unless you have experienced it how can you have fear unless you have experienced it like when we were kids we had no idea about what computers were we had heard there is something like computer and suddenly in 80s came the boom now every kid knows what computers are unless you have experienced something you cannot have any idea it's not only about objects it's also about emotions and desires the very idea that we are scared to die is a very interesting thing that even a baby is scared of death I have heard so many people, people whom I know, so scared of death, and they're so scared of losing their loved ones. Losing their loved ones, one can understand, but somehow the death. I mean, you don't know where exactly you are going. Tasam anaditvam charsho nityatvat. all experiences are preceded by desires for happiness this we discussed in the previous talk just to bring up the link so there was no beginning of experience you cannot say that there was any beginning of experience and every fresh experience that we have is built on the past ones now how how is that possible comes sutra number 11 this is very interesting hetu phal ashray alambane sangri tatvat एषाम अभावे तत् अभाव बींग हेल्ड टूगेदर बाय कॉज इफेक्ट सपोर्ट एंड ऑब्जेक्ट्स इन द एब्सेंस ऑफ दीज इज इज इट्स एब्सेंस यू माइट रिमेंबर वी हैड मीन्स एंड वंस देर इज इग्नोरेंस अविद्या एंड देर इज काम डिजायर्स सो अल्टीमेटली माई एग्जिस्टेंस इज ऑल अबाउट इग्नोरेंस ऑफ about my nature and the consequent 
arise of desires within me. If you know that you are a multi-millionaire, multi-billionaire, or supposing you also know that you are, but for some reasons you think that your bank account has gone blank. You spent money and so what you are doing is now is running around to get some money for some purpose. And somebody tells you that look, that payment was due, a huge amount and it is lying in your bank. You just need to take it out. Now those of you, my dear audience, those of you who have been listening to these talks, by now you must have understood one thing that at least theoretically you understand that you are not this body. Theoretically you understand that actually you are the soul and yet you are not able to be established on that. Why? It's something like that billionaire or in Indian, Indian language Karodupati. Billionaire may be the larger sum coming down a little. You have crores. Tens of millions. You know that. You also know that you have lost. You don't know that some reimbursement has come. Even if it has come, you need to go through some paperwork. Right now you are going through those paperwork. Because by now you know what you are. What is that paperwork? To get rid of those desires. Desires that make you run here and there. We are all continuously in search of happiness. You think that if you can do this, you will be happy. If you think that if you can get rid of this, you will be happy. Happiness always eludes you. Why? Because there can be no happiness in nature. <laughs> <coughs> happiness is to be established in your own nature, not after running the external nature. How to destroy it? The only way is if you can destroy the mind. People who commit suicide, they don't realize that, that they are destroying their bodies their mind will continue to be there. And this mind, this is Hetu Fal Ashraya Alamban, says Avidya, then there is Purushartha, we will explain, then there is Chitta and there is Visay. The four things, Visay is the objects. And Chitta is this mind stuff, Purushartha, desire to acquire and ultimate ignorance. Avidya, Kam, Karma. Put very simply, there are objects and there is ignorance, there is a desire and your action, Purushartha. Now these four, when combined together, they keep desires alive. If you want to destroy, if you want to destroy the whole thing, you need to get rid of mind. Unless you can get rid of mind, desires will continue. Mind and desires, they are all linked. There is no way. There is just no way that you can keep one and let other go. They are synonymous. Mind is synonymous with desires. If you have desires, you have mind. Now, it's a very interesting thing. Those of you who are familiar with Sri Ramakrishna's Ram words and teachings and life, Know that whenever Sri Ramakrishna went into Samadhi, now he being an incarnation of God, he being God, even if his mind merged in his that true state where he was established in what he was, he had to come down because he was here for the upliftment of the masses. So he himself says that he used to keep some desire in his mind before going into that state. And what were those desires? 
Then he would take some water. He would do this, he would do that. Because those desires were there, even though he went into Samadhi, he had to return. Why he had to return? Because the desire made the mind alive. Those of you might have read my storybook, Kratu. In Kratu, it's that. Kratu now wants to merge into that infinite. But he has that one desire, just one desire left. To find his friend. And he cannot cross that wall. If you have the slightest desire, mind will be there. If you have mind, you cannot cross over. Hetu fal ashray alam mane. These four have to be destroyed. Unless you can destroy these four, desires will not be destroyed. See, it's like huge net. You hold one thread and all the other threads come along. Either you have to live with the whole or you have to give up all. It's just no. It's, I mean, there's a famous saying in English: "Winner take all." <laughs> if you want to be winner in the world, you have to take the whole. If mind is there, other things will be there. If other things are there, desire will be in full bloom. And once desire is in full bloom, that. Raga, Dues, Avinives, everything will come and you can do nothing about it. Swamiji says, moreover, so long as the senses receive the external objects, fresh desires will arise. If it be possible to get rid of the cause, effect, support and object, that is Avidya, Purushartha, Chitta and Vishaya, then alone it will vanish. Ultimately, ignorance has to be burned down by knowledge. The knowledge of who you are. So, now comes it's a very interesting sutra, number 12. Atit anagatam swarupo, swarupato asti advabhedat dharmanam The past and future exist in their own nature. Qualities having different ways. You <laughs> see, it's a, it's a very interesting thing about this book is that if you read the sutras, you cannot understand anything. Even if you read it in English, you really cannot understand. Swamiji had uh, delivered elaborate talks. And when these were edited into a book, it's a very good book. And well, I personally follow only this. Many of my friends have said, they cannot understand anything. Actually, this is a scripture. Raj Yoga is a full scripture. And being full scripture, you need to study it under a teacher. Unless you study it under a teacher, you cannot understand anything. Starting Sutra 12, Yoga gets down to contradicting two important schools of Buddhism. Shunyavad, Shrenka Vigyanavad. According to Shunyavad, everything comes from non-existence. Existence, existence come into being from non-existence. And uh, this confusion has come from Lord Buddha's words, Nirvana, which means to get extinguished. Now we won't go into the details of Shunyavad. <laughs> it's beyond me, I am not even student of uh, buddhistic philosophy just to tell in brief we can say there are three prominent schools of philosophy in the western world objectivism idealism and realism this we have discussed earlier we have also discussed in inspired talk series objectivism means objects are really there in idealism, everything is in your mind. Broadly, these are the two schools. Now, if you look at uh, yoga philosophy, yoga philosophy is nearer to objectivism, but not fully, because we discussed in one of the earlier talks, 
how objectivism is just not possible. However, as far as yoga is concerned, objectivism is objects are accepted, objects are accepted as true, but there is a very strong play of mind in the form of a reaction of the mind. Those of you who are interested in this discussion can listen to our first, first and second talk and you will know where Swamiji explains that what is world? Here is this pen and sensation from this pen comes to my mind. My mind throws a reaction. This reaction is my knowledge and this reaction is my world. This being so, now when I say this pen, where from this pen came? Did it come from Shunya or did it always exist? At least before its creation, before its manufacturing, when the pen was manufactured, before that where did it exist? Now, according to Shunyavad, it did not exist. And once it's broken down, it, it will cease to exist. Yog does not agree with that. Yog says that an object was always there. It will continue to be there. Sometimes it is manifest as object. At other times, it is invisible since it is in the form of three qualities, three guna, sattva, rajas, tamas. Now, this is a very, very interesting sutra because this sutra can be explained in many ways. Before I continue with the explanation, let me tell you about a very interesting article I read recently. Came from one of the journals in neurosciences. Now, neurosciences fascinate me a lot more than this evolutionary biology and all those. Now, now there is one Tony Kofi. Many of you might have heard his name. He's a very successful jazz musician, cellist. He plays on saxophone. So, he has uh, even won many awards. I don't know much about him. I was When I was going through this article, I was surprised to read. Now, he himself has narrated. When he, when he was 16, just 16, he was not into music. And once he fell down from the third floor of the building. And... Uh, he himself described that time seemed to slow down for him. Sri Ramakrishna also describes that uh, when he enters Samadhi, time slows down. Time has stretches. And then he saw a series of complex images, series of images flashing before him. Now see, if we talk about these things, people will doubt us. People will laugh at us. Now he, he is an American, he is a magician, nothing to do with spiritual, absolutely nothing to do with spiritual. He is just narrating his experiences. And he describes himself, in mind, I saw many things, children that I hadn't even had, had yet. He is seeing children, his own, and friends that I had never seen, but are now my friends. He is seeing in those images, things that really struck in my mind was playing an instrument. So those images were partly lost because he was thinking that these are my children and these are my friends. But most importantly, there was a musical instrument which he had not seen ever. And yet he felt that he is connected with that musical instrument. And uh, then he lost his consciousness. Now, 
after coming to the hospital he felt like a different person and he didn't want to return to his previous life when he had fallen down he felt as if he is someone different and he was hospitalized and those images kept flashing he felt as if something is being shown to him and he also felt that probably all these images sh show his future and uh, once he was dis discharged he saw a picture of saxophone and instantly he recognized that as one of those images so he got some compensation money because of the fall films and uh, what he did was he purchased a saxophone from that money although he had never played on that earlier and then he started playing he became a maestro and uh, something like bbc award bbc jazz award and all he got now what neuroscience is is very uncommon uh, normally once life flashes by seeing the future this is very troublesome uh, scientists are not able to explain this phenomenon now if this thing had come from one of us scientists would have laughed it away but they can't and they are very clear that they don't know why it happened how it happened now one of the theories offered is that our normal understanding is that time is a linear thing time is a linear thing why because according to the bible now mind it every time science tries to be rational it doesn't even realize that it is talking only from the bible according to the bible god created the universe now universe is moving and universe will end so naturally time is moving in an arrow it's such an obvious thing we hindus or other indians that is indian system of thoughts that includes buddhism and jainism and sikhism if you accept sikhism as a separate system of thought although it doesn't have there is nothing all linear everything is cyclic everything is cyclic so now scientists say that if you take uh, einstein's theory of relativity they use a term they say there is a term term by the scientists no not my terms they say static block universe in static block universe is a very strange thing they say that time is spread out as if like in hologram is spread out when you are at a particular moment you can see things absolutely clearly at other places it is kind of fuzzed out so according to some theory of physics now i don't know much about this i'm just uh, quoting from this writing from uh, one of those journals neuroscience and uh, then they quote immanuel kant and all according to him time is not an objective real phenomena time is not an objective real phenomena huh, whatever these things may mean now this tony coffee if you if you accept his words as true for example if you those of you who have studied sri ram krishna's biography sri ram krishna had many predictions for many sometimes he used to talk about his disciples as belonging to the group of shri krishna of jesus of chaitanya mahaprabhu but those images were not always very 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 clear he could see uh, he was not very clear and he could also see future not the way we see say this pen the 
there are many many instances for example once he told holy mother sri sarada devi that he saw that he had gone to some land where people were of white skin that is foreign land the mother was <laughs> mother got worried she said that she said your stomach is so delicate how will your stomach bear that uh, different kind of food things like that and he had seen how swami vivekananda in those days he was narendranath the future swami vivekananda will be preaching to the world these things had come to him as vision now what we describe just now of tony it was some kind of vision what is that vision is it mental projection or is it time where time has fuzzed out surprisingly patanjali it says exactly this time is fuzzed out it's like hologram in hologram what happens the same picture is spread out when you are focusing at one point through some instrument you see it very clearly other places they are all fuzzed out spread out swami says the idea is that existence never comes out of non existence and that is why the sages sages were known as kavi kavi one who can see past present and future the famous expression is trikal darshi one who can see past present and future lord krishna tells in gita i know past present and future whole thing comes to him as a complete picture patanjali says that uh, past has gone into the grave grave of what time and future is waiting in the womb of time now all these popular sayings that we come across that past is gone future is yet to arrive no these are not true they are all there nothing goes away nothing goes away everything stays just that you are able to perceive something our senses and our mind are structured in such a way that you can see a particular picture if per chance your mind goes backward or forward you can only see fuzzed out pictures i hope the idea is clear te vyakt sukshma gunatma na they are manifested or fine being of the nature of the gunas so the past and the future they are sattva rajas tamas in that state so they are thinned out kind of so whose gross state is the sensible universe the universe that we are seeing is a gross state past and future arise from the different modes of manifestation of these gunas there are the different modes of manifestation they are not purely sattva rajas tamas they are different mode now by chance if your mind can go into that mode you can see your future you can see your past in fact the famous term jati smar one who can remember all his past births which we i mean that if a person gets established in aparigra not accepting anything he remembers his past life not that you can go and change the past they will come to you as images now this is very interesting they will come to you as images you cannot go there and change you can just see you are not you are you will not be seeing even a clear picture forget about interfering even sri ram krishna when he was describing his vision both of past and future you can very clearly feel through those description that that uh, the visions were not 
as clear as we are seeing things right now. Now, when he was experiencing God, it was clearer than the universe that we see. But the events when he was seeing, they were not as clean, not as clear. <coughs> now, if this be true, and Patanjali is very clearly stating it's like this, then Shuniva, things coming out from nowhere, merging into nowhere, cannot hold. They don't hold. Paridam ekatvad vastu tattvam. Surprisingly, Patanjali says that these are born of three gunas. But their coordinated result, the coordinated result is one single object. Can you imagine, you know, it's so amazing. This pen, this is born of Sattva Rajasthamas. And this microphone, this is also born of Sattva Rajasthamas. However, their coordinated effort, the coordinated result is such that this is microphone and there is a pen. So the actually the changes are coordinated. Changes are coordinated in such a way. And when they are staying in the future, from the future when they come before us, all the transformations get coordinated. It's amazing. Patanjali is not presenting some philosophy before us. Something that you can go on thinking and discussing. and No, he is just stating a fact. A fact which you need very badly so that you can get out of this world. This sutra also explains the fundamental difference between mind and matter. Although mind is matter, but as far as objects are con concerned, objects, objects are getting transformed. That means they are moving from the subtle to the gross, from the fine to the gross at certain speed. And mind is moving from fine to the gross at certain other speed. And that is why we are able to observe them. So, essentially they mean to say that objects are always there and they present to us as, as objects because of their coordinated transformations. And then comes Sutra number 15. It's again very interesting. Vastu Samye Chitta Vedat Tayor Vivakta Pantha. Perception and desire vary with regard to the same object, mind and object are of different nature. First was this idea that objects and mind. And from there, now Patanjali is saying that objects and minds are different. You cannot say that object is in the mind. Now it's yoga is attacking Shanik Vigyanabad and yoga is attacking idealism. According to idealism, the objects are in the mind. Now, if objects were in the mind, that is, if Kshanik Vigyanavad is true, then there are certain problems. There is a dream. When you sleep, you see a dream. And that dream is exclusively for you. Now, if you are trying to compare this world with a dream, then of course it will appear that uh, the whole thing is like dream. Perfectly all right. But when we look at an object, any object, let's say there is sweet, sweet meat. There is one chocolate. Now we find that this chocolate is creates happiness in some creates misery in others. If somebody who has the problem of weight or problem of sugar, diabetes. And some people get obsessed. And some people are indifferent. Now we monks, 
were indifferent to lots of things. The, if the objects were in the mind, then they, they should have produced same kind of feeling, but they don't. Swamiji says, there is an objective world independent of, of our minds. This is a refutation of Buddhistic idealism. Since different people look at the same thing differently, Unless there is an objective reality where your mind goes, applies to that and returns with different feelings that shows that object and mind are different. If objects and minds were same, the reaction would have been same. Reactions are not same. That shows that object is being captured by the mind. It is being captured by the mind and returning with a different kind of feeling that shows object and mind have to be different because same object is creating different kind of perception. When I show my pain, I have this feeling that I use this pain. When you look at it, you will say this pen belongs to this Swamiji. You have, we have different feelings. That we have different feelings show that object and mind are different. If object and mind are different, then you cannot say that the object belongs only to the mind. Object has to have an independent reality. So, further we had discussed while discussing mind in our earlier talks that we had mentioned that when the object creates a sensation, mind throws a reaction and mind takes the form of the object. Because mind takes the form of the object that shows that mind itself is changeable. It's undergoing changes. This creates a very serious situation. Tad uparag apekshitvat chittasya vastu Gyata agyatam. Things are known or unknown to the mind, being dependent on the coloring which they give to the mind. Mind is undergoing continuous change. It is aware of lots of things. Mind is aware of objects. Mind is also aware of time. And at other times, it's not aware of time. Sometimes it is aware of itself. Sometimes it is not aware of itself. That shows that mind is continuously undergoing transformation. Continuously. That means mind is changeable. If mind is changeable, in that case, mind cannot be soul. Because soul has to be something, by, by its very definition, something that never undergoes any change. Objects are continuously changing as we know. Senses keep on changing as we know. Only problem is with mind. Is mind the soul? Very often people try to think and explain as if mind is the soul. But mind cannot be soul. Mind is continuously changing. It's continuously getting transformed. Transformation is the way of existence for mind, as we explained. First, mind takes the form of the object. Second, mind is aware of time. Mind is at other times not aware of time. Mind is aware of certain objects. Mind is again not aware of certain objects. Mind can study itself. Sometimes it cannot study itself. That means mind is never steady. This takes, it, takes us to a very famous uh, idea. Sada jyata chitta vritya tat prabho purushasya 
अपरिणामित्वात दी स्टेट ऑफ माइंड आर ऑलवेज नोन बिकॉज द लॉर्ड ऑफ द माइंड द पुरुष इज अनचेंजेबल बट इफ यू वॉन्ट यू कैन नो द स्टेट ऑफ द माइंड एनी टाइम यू वॉन्ट जस्ट नीड टू यू नो वेरी ऑफन वी से दैट स्टडी योर ओन माइंड यू से स्टडी योर माइंड यू आर ऑब्जर्विंग योर ओन माइंड हाउ कैन यू ऑब्जर्व योर ओन माइंड इज इट पॉसिबल it is possible because mind is continuously getting transformed now when you are watching that mind mind is watching the mind somewhere this process of watching has to be unified because unless it gets unified you cannot have the knowledge is a very simple argument apparently it appears very difficult when mind is observing the mind itself there is transformation that is why mind is able to study the mind and if there is this transformation and mind itself is studying the mind so there has to be a common platform where all these things are getting unified otherwise the knowledge will not be generated swami ji explains this very beautifully that will make it because at places some of these explanations are so beautiful that uh, we should be entering that the whole gist of this theory is that the universe is both mental and material so some of these explains yog that this universe is both mental and material and these are both in a continuous state of flux this is very 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 important thing if you want to study yoga if you want to study you want to understand yoga you need to understand that both mind and matter they are in a continuous state of flux so the changes are rhythmical is a rhythm about the changes science tries to study the rhythm of matter when science is trying to explain matter is explaining the rhythm whether it is newtonian physics is rhythm einstein's theory of relativity is studying the rhythm quantum physics you are studying the rhythm our mind also has its own rhythm says the mind and body are like two layers in the same substance there is the soul the two different layers mind and body swami ji used to talk about repeatedly now if you go by vedanta they in fact come with very clear term known as kosha pancha kosha there is this annamaya body that survives through food prana man man mind <laughs> like that and says that moving at different rates of speed so body is moving at some speed and mind is moving at a different speed transformation in body is faster transformation in mind is slower see normally we think that mind moves very fast of course mind moves very fast it's finer as far as transformation is concerned body transforms faster than the mind think of a cow think of a buffalo you know that the mind of a buffalo or a cow does not evolve your mind evolves slowly when you you know just in passing one joke once i met an old friend after maybe 15 20 years and he exclaimed oh wonderful you look the same i told that look i don't take it as words of praise i take is a condemnation you mean to say that i have not evolved in 20 years now you were slightly embarrassed now if in 20 years you continue to be the same there is something seriously wrong with you it only means that your body might have changed you might have become leaner fatter your mind has not changed when you open your mouth when you speak people should know that you have evolved a child grows he reaches maybe 
20, 25, 30. And after that, his mental growth nearly stops. He doesn't even read books. His knowledge bank stops exactly where it was, maybe when he was hardly 30 or maybe 25. Actually, he stops evolving. And his body continues to grow and decay, etc., etc. Speed is different. So, from there you see, Swamiji takes the example of relative motion. And uh, we, we are talking about transformation. So, Swamiji said, how is the mind to perceive? It's also in flux. Therefore, another thing is necessary, which moves more slowly. It's not about transformation. Whole thing moves much more slowly. And this is soul. So, you have matter which is moving very fast. There is mind which is moving a little slower. And there is soul that never moves. You go to a railway platform. And you find two trains simultaneously leaving the station. One is moving faster. Maybe one is an express train. You're going through and there is passenger train. So you can very clearly see that one is moving faster and another is moving slower. And there is a railway platform itself which is not moving. Soul is something like that. There is soul, there is mind and there is the body. Swami says, logic compels you to stop somewhere. Now this is one very serious problem with Kshanik Vigyanvad and Swamiji repeatedly attacked Kshanik Vigyanvad on this. You just can't say that everything is in flux. How do you know? Then? Something has to move slower. Otherwise you cannot say that this is moving. To, to feel the movement, to feel the motion, one thing has to move slowly compared to the other. You must complete the series by knowing something which never changes. Because see, if you go on telling that this is slower, slower, somewhere you have to stop, otherwise it will go on ad infinitum. It will continue infinitely. Behind this never-ending chain of motion is the Purusha, the changeless, the colorless, the pure. All these impressions are merely reflected upon it as a magic lantern throws images upon a screen without in any way tarnishing it. Think of movie halls. Now, nowadays movie halls, I hear that they're becoming obsolete. But when we were kids, it used to be screens and light was thrown on it. If there was no screen, the pictures would not have appeared as movies. It would not have appeared at all. Like if you throw torchlight uh, to the space, you cannot see anything. Soul is like that screen. And this world, this mind, they're the combination that come as light coming out from say projector. And picture gets unified. The idea is to say that mind is continuously changing and there has to be a platform where all these things unite. They form a cohesive picture. Natat sabhavam drishyatvat. Now since you can observe your mind, it cannot be swaprakash. It cannot be self-effulgent. The mind is not self-luminous being an object. They use a very simple, very simple argument. Objects cannot have light of their own. Light means light of knowledge. The Swamiji in his inimical style says, tremendous power is manifested everywhere in nature. But it is not self-luminous, not essentially intelligent. Intelligence is not in objects. The 
The Purusha alone is self-luminous and gives its light to everything. Objects cannot have self-knowledge. Because if an object has knowledge, it will know. Actually, earlier we had discussed that objects do not know each other. Even senses do not know each other. It cannot have the knowledge. So, but what about mind? It says that since mind is matter, it cannot have self illumination. It cannot have. This is not possible. The Swami said, tremendous power is manifested everywhere in nature, but it is not self luminous. Swami had this wonderful style of explaining things in an entirely different way. In a way that we can understand, we can appreciate. If the mind were self-luminous, it would be able to cognize itself and its objects at the same time, which it cannot. If you observe your mind, you will see that when you observe an object, you observe an object. You cannot observe the mind itself. Whole thing moves so fast that Actually, we are not even conscious of it. These things require some contemplative silence. When you are watching this pen, you observe this pen, not your mind. When you observe mind, you forget this pen. When you meditate, meditation means to get out of all images, to move out of all sensations. That is how you can meditate, contemplate on your mind. If you want to contemplate on mind, the world has to go. And if you are looking at the world, mind goes away. If mind were self-luminous, then it could have done both. Chittantar drishye buddhi buddher ati prasanga smiti sankarascha Another cognizing mind being assumed, there will be no end to such assumptions and confusion of memory will be the result. This is a famous uh, logic used by different philosophies in different places. Now if you say that there is another mind which is perceiving these two states of mind, well, you know I have three minds and to observe the Working of this third mind, you will need a fourth mind. And this will continue. This will continue. In neurosciences also, they have this kind of discussion. So, if there is another mind, there will be still another mind. It will continue. Now, worse, there will be confusion of memory, as happens with mental cases. And you have schizophrenic and others. There is a total confusion in the brain. And that problem will come to every person if there are too many minds within a head. Which means mind is not self-luminous. Chitte prati sankramayas Tad akara patto sa buddhi samvedanam. The essence of knowledge, the purusha, being unchangeable, when the mind takes its form, it becomes conscious. Now, that discussion, discussion where certain characteristic of mind in relation to the world has been explained. Now, the discussion moves on. The relation of mind with Purusha, with consciousness. It says, the essence of knowledge, the Purusha being unchangeable. Purusha is unchangeable by its essence. When the mind takes its form, it becomes conscious. I mean, actually, we all of us know and we instinctively feel that mind is conscious. We can use this example, we can use that example, and examples do not prove something. To explain something, we need examples. Examples do not prove anything.
what yoga says is that that knowledge is not quality of purusha knowledge is purusha and when the mind comes near the purusha that knowledge gets reflected in the mind he says as it were upon the mind and the mind for the time being becomes knowing and seems as if it were itself the purusha so how this process of uh, knowing this world comes we had been focusing on this aspect since the beginning of the series of talks purusha is knowledge purusha is the light of knowledge mind which is a fine state of matter now when you look at evolution according to yoga according to sankhya even according to vedanta or as swami ji repeatedly says matter has different states the gross state is this world the final state is this mind knowledge being beyond you know gross and fine is a solid unified thing when the mind is near purusha and as mind is more and more purified it gets illumined by purusha the essence of knowledge purusha being unchangeable purusha by its very nature is unchangeable is of the nature of knowledge when the mind takes its form so mind at all times takes the form of purusha so mind appears infinite mind appears conscious mind appears as if it knows things it's all mind 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 and that's why in the western world whenever they talk about consciousness they are talking about states of mind they don't understand atman they don't understand purusha they, they will not accept that of course it does not matter with us whatever patanjali had to say he has explained in this yoga if you want to believe it if you want to practice it you do it and you will know if you don't want you want you just want to argue you go on arguing there is no end to arguing nor can you reach any conclusion the purpose of yoga goal of patanjali is not to explain mind it is a stepping stone he just explains well why how mind is luminous it's near purusha if you if you want to understand the best example is tube light or any of these lights electricity passes through some gas in some kind of subatomic illumination particles become lighted up and when it comes through that glass different gases are there and they get ionized different principles are used and there is light you think that tube light is lighted up no it's not it is the gas within the tube that is ionized is the electricity that is making it do that if electricity were not there it would be as dead as any other inert matter mind when it is near purusha it it catches the nature of it catches the essence of purusha and appears lit up with intelligence it appears and behaves as if this is purusha so that's uh, that is how mind works
and that is how it is able to mind is able to understand everything so is it that mind doesn't understand we have been discussing mind is matter mind is not self luminous so does mind understand or not mind does understand how because it acquires the nature of soul although not permanently so now very few sutras remain this we will cover in the next talk and maybe we will give a break of one saturday and then maybe we will take up a mandukya karika which is a very important work in vedanta philosophy in this series we are trying to cover some of these philosophies some of the sacred books or if you dear listeners suggest something else we might consider we have two week two three weeks time thank you so much om shanti 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 हरिओम तत्सत श्री राम कृष्णार्पण नमस्ते